he gave this sermon on the person of Jesus Christ. The example he used was if you had a thousand dollars to your name, would you give nine hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cent to Jesus and keep one penny just in case Jesus wasn't who he said he was? If you kept that one penny, you would show that you did not have faith. He said you got to give it all. You got to give it all to the person who gave it all for you so that you could have life and have it eternally. So at that point, I realized, man, I've been a good person for 23 years, but I am not a Christian. I am not a follower of Christ. I am not one of his disciples. I've just been morally good. Mm. That didn't sit well with me, and I was not going to leave that church that day until I settled my eternal destiny. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Rooted in Christ podcast. My name is Eric Stevens, the founder of Redwood Christian Ministries. Thank you for tuning back in this week. It is a pleasure to have you all back and listening. Today, I am joined by a very special guest. We have on the show today, former NFL player, Wade Manning. Wade, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing pretty good. It's kind of hot in in Denver right now, it's 98 degrees today. There you go. There you Usual go. For December. <laughs> what's the what's the humidity like right now? You got any? Oh man, two percent. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> so before I get started, I need to let everybody know. So Wade used to play for the Dallas Cowboys and the Denver Broncos. So Wait, I got to tell you, like this podcast right now and having you on here is proof that that Jesus is real because everybody who knows me, and if they don't know me, they're about to find out right now, I can't stand the Dallas Cowboys. Okay, <laughs> I, I, I'm not a fan. I, I just, I don't like anything about them. And I have to remind Dallas Cowboy fans that Deion Sanders was a long time ago, but I, I, I digress, but I just I thank you for being on the show today. Though. Thank you for being here. <laughs> you you sound like Tom Landry to me. Oh, wow. <laughs> did not want the Dallas Cowboys to be labeled America's team. They had lost the Super Bowl that January to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And they were favored to win the Super Bowl and they lost. 35 to 31 on that Jackie Smith drop catch in the end zone and uh, NFL films. They didn't know what to name the off season film and they didn't want it to be a name where the Cowboys were a failure, not when they went to the Super Bowl two years in a row. So they flew to Dallas, Ed Sable and his dad. They flew to set to Dallas and presented to Landry, <laughs> who was against it, but to the president of the team, Tech Schramm, can we name your off-season film America's team? And Landry said, no, because it'll put a target on our back. And Tech Schramm was a marketing guy. He was like, yes, that would be great. And guess what that was my rookie year 1979 so that's when America team started now that means we didn't have not one easy game because everybody wanted to knock off America's team so there was no week where we could just sit back relax we got this Uh uh-uh they was bringing their best every game and now here we are 43 years later and they still calling them America's team and other teams in the league, they don't like it. So they're still hated everywhere they go. <laughs> and now that the Cowboys haven't made the playoffs in a while, you know, since Jerry Jones won three Super Bowls out of four years, they happy to beat up on Jerry. So you ain't the only one. You ain't by yourself. You got a whole lot of people that just absolutely hate. The Dallas Cowboys. It's not, I don't know if it's so much that I hate the Cowboys. I, that's not true. Yes, it is. But it's also, I do, I do hate the expectation of the Dallas Cowboys. That is, that is every year is their year. 
every year. And every year, it's just not true. <laughs> right. Well, that's how they keep their fan base going. They kind of sort of try to do that here in Denver <clears throat> since Elway won a couple of Super Bowls. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then Peyton Manning came in here and took us to two Super Bowls and one Super Bowl 50. So they, they try to have that expe expectation too. But as a former player, we kind of look at the teams a little differently than fans. And right. you know whether or not you got a good football team or not. And we haven't had a Super Bowl caliber team since Peyton Manning retired. Uh, they're trying to make that a run this year with Russell Wilson. However, we got a couple of weak links that got to be tightened up or Russell Wilson's going to be running for his life, just like Teddy Bridgewater and, and Drew Locke were. My, my concern for that, that Broncos team this year is actually their depth chart. Um, I think, I think from a, from a positional standpoint, their starters look strong, but a couple injuries and it's, you know, we don't know, you don't know who's going to be in that lineup and what they're, what they're really capable of doing. So that, that's actually been my, my concern going into the season for, for Denver is, is the depth of, of that team. Yeah. And injuries are an issue. You're going to get hurt. Right. And it's just, if you can play with it, 100% of the players that play in the league get hurt right matter whether you can play with it i am going to take a quick pause just to say in the event that Deion sanders is listening i still want you on the podcast and i'm sorry for making fun of the dallas cowboys if it helps <laughs> he'd be all right he played for the falcons he played for the 49ers the cowboys and he went to the ravens he'd be all right my comment section is probably going to be on fire with these Dallas Cowboy comments on YouTube. I'm just waiting. I, there's no way this won't get flagged. <laughs> well, but I got I to gotta thank them for something because without them, I don't know how I was going to open up this show today. So this was a pretty good opening segment for me right now. I'm, I'm gonna, I like this. I guess I should thank the Dallas Cowboys, but I had something to talk about today. <laughs> But that's enough about them. I want to I want to introduce you that want to thank you so much for 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 doing the show um, for us today. So let's just let's just talk for a little bit. So let's let's take us back. So where are you from? Where did you grow up? <clears throat> well, as a child, I grew up about 90 miles from Cleveland over in Meadville, Pennsylvania. Our claim to fame there is that we have Allegheny College there. Um. At about 11 years old, before I turned 12, my parents moved to Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, by the time I was 14, they moved to Shaker Heights, hmm. which was one of the richest suburbs in the United States. <clears throat> and I graduated from Shaker Heights High School, worked for a couple of years at a architect, engineer, and planning firm, Dalton, Dalton, Little, and Newport. They were right up there at Warrensville and Chagrin. Um, started out at John Carroll University, going to school at night. I worked full-time, went to school at night. Uh, the architecture engineering firm said that if I would pursue a degree in engineering, that they would pay for it. So I had to pay for my classes. And then if I got an A or a B, they reimbursed me the funds for the classes. Um, my girlfriend from high school's father was the first African-American to graduate from Ohio State University's engineering school. And he knew I was good in math and science. And he says, I think I can get you a minority scholarship if you'll pursue engineering at Ohio State. And I got the minority scholarship and I went off to Ohio State in the spring of 75. I walked on that fall and made the baseball team. And by the time I was a senior, I ran track and played baseball uh, at Ohio State and lettered in both sports. So that was my journey. There we go. There we go. Well, we're happy to, that you spent some time with us with us in in Cleveland. So, when when you were younger, who who were some of the people who um, who influenced your life? Like who? Excuse me. Who were some of the people who like you were influences over you? Uh, Jim Brown. 
Mm. Number 32, Superman with 32 on his back. Um, I was fortunate enough to know him personally, um, even though he was in his last years as a player, but his last years with the team, he lived in Shaker Heights. And so his twins, Kevin and Kim Brown, went to Shaker Heights School. They're a little bit younger than me, but they graduated from high school with my younger sister and brother. And I've kept up with Kim. Haven't seen Kevin too much. Um, and I used to cut their grass when uh, Jim and Sue Brown divorced. She lived in a condominium complex and I would come by and, and cut the grass for her. Um, but I don't know who didn't want to grow up and be Jim Brown mm. as far as his athleticism goes. And I was really caught and mesmerized with his political position on racism in the country. And uh, since Muhammad Ali was one of my, my favorite athletes ever, to see him supporting Muhammad Ali along with Bill Russell and that whole crew, uh, it kept my eye on things. Um, just grew up in a time where I wanted to be aware of what was going on with Martin Luther King, what was going on with Malcolm X, what was going on with the uh, Robert and Bobby Kennedy, uh, Megar Evers. You know, our country was in a turmoil as much as it is right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jim Brown caught my eye. And uh, it's, it's kind of strange that 50 something years later, my youngest child is now a student at Syracuse University where Jim Brown and Floyd Little and Ernie Davis and Larry Zonka, John Mackey went to school. Uh, so I've been a Syracuse fan for a long time, even though I grew up in Pennsylvania, could have been a Penn State fan, grew up in Ohio, could have been an Ohio State fan. You know, Syracuse was always in the back of my mind. So I guess I was trying to bleed orange instead of bleed brown, but Jim Brown. Is there any advice that he gave you that that stuck out? Anything, any anything you're like, you know what? He told me this until this day. I just it stuck with me. Yeah, we used to get our hair cut at the same barber shop. Mm -hmm. And I remember all these young kids sticking their nose up against the glass to try to see the great Jim Brown. And I knew the person that owned the barber shop. So I was always allowed to go in. Mm -hmm. One thing that Jim Brown said to me was pay attention to detail, young man. Pay attention to detail. And that stuck with me and that's who I've been all of my life when it comes to playing a sport. I wanted to be as skillful as anybody. School, I wanted to be as smart as anybody and get good grades, but be really detailed in what I was doing. Um, and if I do any kind of shade tree mechanic or work around my house, man, I try to do it so that nobody would think that I did it. I <laughs> want them to think that a professional did it. Right. So that was the advice that he gave me, pay attention to detail. I would like to thank YouTube for the reason I can do any kind of work around my house because they have all those how-to videos for people like me who are completely inept at doing work around the house. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to know I did it without YouTube. So I like to just take time to thank them so much, so much. So how 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 often would you say you spoke to Jim Brown? How how much interaction do you think you had with him um, growing up? Well, from probably 1964 until he started making movies, The Dirty Dozen, mm -hmm. maybe every couple of weeks because we were always going to get our hair cut at around the same time. Right. And of course, had to get that same cut that he had with all the hair off the sides and back and that little bit on the top. Right. Yeah. So every, every couple of weeks, once he moved and started making movies, you know, he moved to California, became a Hollywood star. Mm -hmm. I didn't see him for a long time. And then he wrote his first book and he came to Denver to uh, publicize the book. And I went to a Safeway. And it was amazing that 
he knew exactly who I was. When I walked up to that table, wow. he said, little Wade, man, come over here and sit down. Tell me how in the heck did you end up in the NFL? Because when I was a youngster, the, the whole time he ever knew me, I was never taller than five foot one, barely a hundred pounds. Hmm. So you can imagine this five foot one, barely a hundred pound kid running around talking about he want to be Jim Brown. Hmm. And when he saw me in Denver after my career was over and I was six feet, 195, he was like, boy, you sure did grow up. And I said, yeah, I did. I, do all, I did all my growing late after high school and I grew 11 inches in one year and gained 70 pounds and I was a new person. Mr. Brown, I always called him Mr. Brown. And uh, he says, wow, so how did you end up in the NFL when you didn't play football? And I just told him, speed. I had the speed and I was almost 200 pounds and the Dallas Cowboys took a chance on me. So that, that was one of my, that was gonna be one of my, my questions was, so how did you play sports in high school and college and how did you make, make it to the NFL? Yeah, I played, uh, Basketball and baseball, mostly. Um, I played football in the eighth grade and the ninth grade. I actually played for the junior Cleveland Browns when I was in the eighth grade. I mean, the ninth grade, uh, played for Cadillac Music. Had the same uniforms as the Browns. And then by the time I got to high school, I had an injury that wouldn't allow me to play, but I played my sophomore year, partial season, and I was a little guy, but I still wanted to play. By the time I was a junior, I just felt like I was too small. So I continued to play baseball and basketball. And by the time I was a senior, I was captain of the basketball team and a co-captain of the baseball team. And uh, got drafted by the Cleveland Indians in the winter draft of 1974, a few months after I graduated from high school. So basically, I played basketball and baseball. Um, when I went to Ohio State, I walked on and made the baseball team. And then you can call it ego, talking trash, whatever you want to call it. But my roommate was captain of the track team my senior year. And he bet me that I couldn't beat him running. <clears throat> and I said, oh, yeah, I can beat you running. <laughs> I've been watching you for three years and I ain't seen you beat nobody. And he said, if I asked that I wouldn't be playing that sissy baseball. So I went out and trained with them in the fall for two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, they had a time trial. And I asked the track coach, Frank Zubovich, who was the former track coach at Glenville for years, won a bunch of state championships in track there. I asked him, could I get in and run the 60 yard dash with his sprinters? And he says, well, yeah, I see you've been doing the workouts. I thought maybe you were trying to be a walk on. And I got in and he put me in lane eight and uh, he shot that gun and I never saw anybody to my left. <laughs> and I won and I broke Jesse Owens 60 yard dash record. The first time I ran it, I ran six flat. Wow. At 192 pounds. And he was like, who are you? And I said, I'm Wade Manning. I play baseball for Coach Spin. He says, oh, you're the guy that hadn't got caught stealing a base yet. And I said, yeah, that's me. He said, well, if I asked the baseball coach if you could run indoor track for me, would you? And I said, well, yes, it'll get me in shape for my senior year of baseball. And so I ran indoor track. I got second at the at uh, the Big 10 championships to a guy that won four years in a row. And to this day, when I look at that AccuTrack picture, he didn't beat me. We leaned and they gave it to him, but I, my chest got there first, but <laughs> he won it three years in a row, they gave it to him. But I beat him at nationals though. There we go. At the lean. And uh, I was 196 pounds by that time. And that's when the Dallas Cowboys saw me running track at almost 200 pounds and running world-class times. And they thought that I could, I could make the transition to football because of my athleticism. 
I absolutely love my friends who trash talk me. Like that is just like so much that that is like I love it. That healthy competition just amongst friends sometimes, like how you just told them I've seen you run for three years, you haven't beat anybody. <laughs> <laughs> So I do a little bit of, of kickboxing and Muay Thai. So it's a little bit different for us because we get locked inside a ring or a cage or a room and we get to punch each other to see exactly who's really about what they're saying. <laughs> At least you guys just ran and nobody got hurt in this case. But it's always good to have those friends just bring the best out of you like that. That's that's always that competition in sports is something I love. Yeah, I mean, you know, you got to you got to protect your honor. <laughs> so what was I'm just curious now, what was your 40 time? You might have said that already, but just in case. Well. It's it's a sore subject for not for me to talk about, because, look, man, I I'm a truthful individual. Mm -hmm. So let's just give you a little history behind it. So. When I got invited to go to the NFL training day at Ohio State, because they didn't have pro days yet, and they didn't have the Indianapolis Combine. A scout from the Seattle Seahawks was the one that invited me. And uh, I had never run a 40-yard dash. For baseball, you run 60. Mm -hmm. Indoor track, I ran 60. Mm -hmm. So I went to my track coach, Frank Zubovich, and I said, look, I'm going to run for the pro scouts in a couple of weeks, and I've never run a 40. Will you time me in the 40? Now, this was my college track coach. He says, yes, I'll time you. So I went to our French field house, warmed up, got ready, and uh, I ran a 419 in the 40 for him on the same indoor track that they had this training day at. So he says, wait, you've run track for me and I have not, I haven't seen your, that you were accelerating like this. He says, look, let's make sure this is 40 yards. Let's measure it. So we measured it. It was 120 feet. That's 40 yards. He said, all right, now that we know it's 40, go back and run it again. And he got me at 4.19. Hmm. Now, I never lie about it. I had on my track spikes. So, of course, that gave me traction. But he asked me, can you catch the football? And I said, coach, I've been chasing that little white baseball all my life. I can't miss the moon. They, they kicking and throwing the moon around. I can't miss that. <laughs> so when I went to the pro day, <clears throat> 87 guys other than me got invited and they all played football. I was the last person to run the 40 that day because I didn't play football. They said, well, you're going to have to wait. So when I got ready to run, I asked the question, what's the fastest 40 today? And they said, four, four, two, Ron Springs. And Ron was on the track team with me, the indoor track team with me. And I thought Ron was faster than that. Now, Ron was big, you know, he about 218, but I still thought he was faster than four, four. And I said, that's slow. And they said, look, there ain't a handful of people in the world that can run under four or five. I said, well, I must be one of them because I can't run six flat and be going at four five at 40. I got to be faster than that. Plus, I already knew I ran 419 twice. So I had on some turf shoes that I borrowed from Ray Griffin, Archie Griffin's younger brother. Mm -hmm. So I ran my first 40 and I ran a four, two, three. And it was a hush over the field house. You could hear crickets. Nobody wasn't saying that. I walked back down, raised my hand, told him I was ready, and I ran my second 40. I ran four, two, five. A scout came over to me and says, look, we haven't ever seen a 40 run this fast. Will you run another one for us? I said, yes. I walked back down. I let him know when I was ready. I ran four, two, seven. Another scout came over to me and asked me, are you running as fast as you can? And I said, yes. And he says, well, it don't look like it. And I said, yeah, I'm a track guy. It's kind of long and flowing and smooth. It's not herky-jerky. And he says, well, look, will you run another one for us? We're going to put watches at 20, and we're going to put watches at 40, because we can't really see your acceleration. 
And we're going to measure this to make sure it's 40 yards. And I asked him, I said, hey, 87 guys ran before me. How come it ain't 40 yards now? He says, you don't understand. We have never seen anything like this. You have run under 4-3 all three times. So we want to put clocks at 20 to see how fast you're going at 20. So I walked back down and I ran again and I ran 429. One of the previous scouts came back over to him and he says, Wait, well, the reason why he's running so fast, he got on track shoes. And I said, No, these are the waffle bottom turf shoe that they wear at Ohio Stadium. I borrowed them from Ray Griffin over there because I knew I couldn't run in my spikes. He said, do you have any other shoes that you could wear? I said, yes, I have a pair of high top Chuck Taylor Converse basketball shoes. You want me to run in them? And they said, yes. So I put the Chucks on and walked back over and I ran 433 in some Chucks. <laughs> That's the slowest 40 I ever ran was 433 in my life. I ran a 421 twice for the Broncos. I ran a 421 for the Browns. And at Dallas on the electronic timing on grass in football shoes, I ran a 4.33 on the electronic timing. And Dr. Bob Ward said that's 4.2 all day long. Any of my listeners right now who are football historians are probably going nuts right now. So, so before I actually get to how the, the Cowboys picked you up and you kind of walked on. so. I wanted to just ask you about, because before we get to the NFL, I want to talk to you a little bit about your, your faith and how that plays into the NFL. So um, were you always following Christ? Were you always a Christian? How Walk us through a little bit of, of that before we get into you going into the, the NFL. All right. Well, before I signed with the Cowboys and reported to Dallas in April of 79, I didn't realize that I wasn't a Christian. Mm. I realized then that I was a churchgoer. Ooh, talk to him. And I went to church and I got my first Bible in 1964 because I went to every single Sunday school in the year of 1964. Mm. It's a King James red letter Bible. They printed my name on the front of it in gold. I was a good kid, moral, didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't swear, did everything my parents told me to do. I got a couple of B's in my life, the rest A's, did everything coaches told me to do. So I was a good moral person. But at that time, I thought because my parents went to church and I went to church and my siblings went to church and classmates I went to school with went to church, I thought we were all Christians. I didn't know that you had to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be a Christian. That's that true. you give up your life to the person that gave his life so that you can, in fact, have life and have it eternally. So when I went to Dallas, I found out that God got jokes. He used football to get me to Dallas to hear Dr. Reverend Eddie Lane speak on the person of Jesus Christ. And the thing that stuck out with me, like Jim Brown told me, pay attention to detail. He gave this sermon on the person of Jesus Christ. The example he used was if you had a thousand dollars to your name, would you give nine hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents to Jesus and keep one penny just in case Jesus wasn't who he said he was? If you kept that one penny, you would show that you did not have faith. Hmm. So you got to give it all. You got to give it all to the person who gave it all for you so that you could have life and have it eternally. So at that point, I realized, man, I've been a good person for 23 years, but I am not a Christian. I am not a follower of Christ. I am not one of his disciples, I just been morally good. Mm. <clears throat> that didn't sit well with me. And I was not going to leave that church that day until I settled my eternal destiny. And at that point, 
I had just reported to Dallas. I hadn't even gone to a first practice that following Monday was my first practice. I ended up at that church because a guy on my track team said, hey, my uncle lives in Dallas. Here's his name. Here's his number. You call him. He'll come get you and he'll show you around Dallas. And I called him and he took me to his house and I had dinner and his wife was a Christian. He was not a believer, but his wife was. And she asked me if I would go to church with them the following day. And I said, yes, being polite. And I said, if I, if I make this football team, I need a church home away from home. But when I went to church the next day, God had a whole nother plan for me. And I heard that message and I became a Christian that day. Praise God for that. I mean, that, that's, that speaks to, to, to total surrender, right? Just giving it all to him and just saying, all right. And sometimes that, that takes time, you know, for us, even sometimes God has to show us. It's like, you think you've given me all of you, but you really haven't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes the, just that stirring up in the spirit to say, you think you've surrendered this, or you think you've given me this, but you, you really haven't given me all of this. So no, thank you for your, your transparency. Yeah. That. I knew because I got that zing in my stomach. Like when you thought you saw something that scared you. Yeah. I got that zing in my stomach when I was like, whoa, I'm not a Christian. If I died today, I wouldn't be going to spend eternity with God. And I just, I didn't like that feeling. And I was going to settle that before I left that church. And I didn't leave until I got a chance to talk with Reverend Lane in his office personally. And by the time I left there, I accepted Christ, said a prayer with him. And when I came out to church to go home, back to North Dallas, you know, the sky didn't light up all crazy. Bombs didn't go off. It wasn't like fireworks or nothing. But inside of me, and I still have that same feeling to this day. Everything changed. And my goal from that point on, it wasn't really football anymore. Now, I knew I had to commit myself to doing my best to try to make this Super Bowl caliber team. But my goal was to please God. And I was not going to let studying for football, doing workouts for football, get in the way of my growth as a Christian. You know, I talk to people, especially when I'm discipling them from time to time, just about it. This isn't even about heaven or hell, right? This is about what you do with Jesus. Yeah. You know, heaven, heaven can't be the point because we need a point person to get there. Therefore, it can't be the point. It's a byproduct. And it's definitely it's it's a I don't want to dumb it down to a byproduct. It's it is definitely. um you know, our reward for, for accepting Christ, because we, we know that obviously for the Christian, this is the only hell that, that we're going to see, but it's what we do with Jesus that, that matters. Right. You know, so, um, no, I thank you for sharing it. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm, we're starting, we, we've recently started a, a new segment on, on the show. It is called behind the curtain. So this is where I have one of my guests just take us behind the curtain so, you know, they can explain to the audience something that the audience may never get a chance to experience in their lifetime. So you're now a Dallas Cowboy. You are inside an NFL locker room. You know, a lot of us are never going to have that experience. So what what was it like just being a Christian and being, you know, in, in an NFL locker room and in this environment? Like, walk walk me through that. <clears throat> Well, I tried to take it in stride because I knew that nobody, no one was bigger than Christ. So I was happy to be in a locker room with all these stars and a few of them went on to be future Hall of Famers, Roger Staubach, Tony Dorsett, Rayfield Wright, Randy White, um, Cliff Harris. But at the same time, a lot of those guys were Christians too. So they were good Christian examples for me, especially Roger. I mean, if you want to grow up and have your child be like anyone, Roger Staubach, you can't go wrong because he is everything that he presented to be. And then, of course, we had a head coach that was not bashful about being a Christian. 
Uh, he, he did a great job of, of mixing his, his faith with football, but he mostly, he lived it. And you could see that he was Christian. You could see in his walk that he was a Christian. But being in the locker room and going out on the practice field was pretty amazing. And you knew that you were with some of the best athletes on planet Earth. I mean, when you saw Tony Dorsett get that ball handed to him or pitched to him and you just saw how smooth he was and how easy he could make his cuts, you knew why he won the Heisman Trophy. When you saw Roger Staubach's tenacity for winning, he didn't believe if there was any time on the clock that he could lose. I played with another guy like that here, John Elway. If there was time on the clock, he didn't believe that he could lose. Somehow he could pull it off. But just the way the work ethic of those guys, mm -hmm. it, it mostly affected me and how I was going to live the rest of my life turning over every stone possible to make sure that you get the job done. And that's what I learned from those guys. The other side of the coin that could have been intimidating is uh, just the, the pure strength and power that these guys had. Mm. Um, they were like almost superhuman and that guys could be this strong, this big and that fast. And today is a testament to it because, you know, the, the, the heaviest player we had, you know, Coach Landry had a weight limit, 265. So oh, wow. even Ed Too Tall Jones only weighed 265. When he came back from boxing, Landry let him play at 278. But Eddie could have probably played at 320, 325 and – and move and been the same but you know he had a weight limit the only team that had 300 pounders was the Steelers and they was all steroided up probably why they all passed away and not one of them alive to this day <clears throat> but you also find out that they're human beings no matter how high you put them up on a pedestal they are just human beings and they're fallible they just have great talent. So being a Christian in that environment, it was pretty amazing because we had Christians on the team mm -hmm. and we had non-Christians and the non-Christians, if they liked you and they liked me, they would not let you get in trouble. They would not let you do the crazy things that they were doing. And it's like, no, you ain't going to do this. And you stay away from that woman and that woman and that woman. She ain't no good. She ain't no good. She ain't no good. And you will not do any drugs. You're going to stay clean. So I was protected. And then God surrounded me, one, with Tom Landry, who was a Christian. And Tom brought in every theologian you can imagine. I met Dr. Tony Evans before he was doctor. Mm -hmm. He did our Bible studies. Gary Smalley, John MacArthur, Josh McDowell, um, Howard Hendricks was the president of Dallas Theological Seminary, and he did our Bible study. So God really put a hedge around me when I accepted Christ in my life. He was not going to let me stray too far to forget about the word. Isn't it crazy how like sometimes people will do something, they'll tell you not to do it. They know it's bad. They know it's bad for them. They know it's hurting them. And then they'll go do it anyway. Like <laughs> It's like, I'm going to tell you not to do this because it's going to be detrimental for you to do it. But I'm still going to go do it as if it's not going to be detrimental for me too. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's crazy, but that happened to me in high school, too. Yeah. After I made it to the college level, playing Division I, after I made it to the NFL, the kids that I grew up with told me, wait, we knew you was going to make it because you didn't drink with us, you didn't smoke with us, you didn't stay out late with us, you was always on top of your grades, we knew you was going to make it. And I was always surprised because they could have done the same thing. Right. 
I wasn't the best athlete in the community. These guys could play, but they didn't stay the course. So they didn't have the same opportunities. And I had an opportunity to take advantage of what came in front of me. This would probably, and I think I'm going to, I'm going to stick with the behind the curtain piece of this just for a little bit longer. Cause I feel like this would be the hardest piece for me personally, as a player, how did you deal with the media? Because I feel like that's the part I would struggle with the most, where it's just like, they ask you certain questions. They'll say certain things just to get under your skin. I feel like I want to tell something about themselves. So <laughs> how did you deal? How did you handle or deal with the media? <clears throat> well, first of all, I watched. I watched a lot of interviews. I watched when they interviewed Roger Staubach. Mm -hmm. I watched when they interviewed Tony Dorsett. I watched when they interviewed Charlie Waters, Cliff Harris, um, Harvey Martin, to see how they handle these questions. And I picked up real quick that they only answer exactly what they've been asked and they don't add nothing to it. And they treat the press like the enemy mm. because I mean, I picked up from watching them. You can't trust these guys. As long as you're doing well, they in your corner. But as soon as you lose a game or blow an assignment, drop a ball, they are gonna be on you. So I learned right away just answer the question as, as plain as possible and, and be done with it. So I know you said that you were, you know, attending church, but you weren't really, you know, you, you know, you knew you weren't a Christian. So obviously football games, especially then they were on Sundays, you know, now we got Saturday, sometimes Sunday, Monday, Thursday, <laughs> right. Were you able to attend church or have some form of church at all on, on Sundays? How did that, how, what did that look like? Yeah, once again, God was good. I, I was on a team that played the second game of the doubleheader. So we didn't play until three o'clock in the afternoon, central time. So I had plenty of time to get up and go to that first service at nine o'clock. And it was close to the stadium and I didn't have to be in the locker room until 1230 for a three o'clock game. So I just went to church. I went to Tony Evans Church. I went to Dr. Reverend Eddie Lane's church to get nourished before I went to the game. And then I got there early enough where they always had a devotional before the game. Landry always invited some theologian in to speak to us before the game. Did you, so do I, do I have, you say you were drafted in 79? Or they picked you up in 79? Yeah, 1979, a free agent. Okay, so now I'm testing my football memory here. So at that time, is was Mike Ditka one of the coaches on that team? Yes, he was my special teams coach. Okay, all right. So, all right, there we go. I got a little bit of football historian in me, just a little bit. <laughs> what was it like being coached by Mike Ditka? Well, the thing that I remember about Coach Dick uh, was his tenacity. I mean, he was always up in the air, energetic. Um, but when I went to training camp, it's different now, but we went to training camp, rookie camp with 87 rookies. And they had 55 returning veterans, 45 that played the year before, and then uh, another eight that was on the practice squad they didn't call it the practice squad then they put you on injury reserve for the whole season but you practice every day so we have 55 returning veterans and 87 rookies I went through rookie camp and I realized who Mike Dicta was in one of our special teams meeting the very first one he said if you're going to make this team it's probably going to be on special teams and I'm going to be the guy that makes that decision. Mm. So if you can run down field, reckless abandon and hit something hard, I don't care if you're doing it wrong, just hit something hard. You can play for me. In my head, I said, got this team made. Mm. 
Cause I'm a four three in the forty. I'm gonna get downfield, and I ain't scared of nothing. I've been crashing into catchers at home plate with no equipment all my life. Now I got some equipment on. Oh yeah, I'm about to tear up something. And I ran downfield, reckless abandon, making tackles. <laughs> Just cause he said, if you go hard, you can play for me. That sounds like Mike Ditka. <laughs> and that that sounds like you. This is okay. But that, that's actually that's actually a perfect segue to my next question because I asked, and the reason I was able to get a hold of you was because of Vance Johnson. So I thank Vance for even putting us in in contact with each other. But I asked Vance this question. So because the NFL is a brutal game. I mean, it it is not, especially the way they used to do special teams. I mean, you're talking about somebody's running at you as fast as they can, as hard as they can to take your head off. So yeah. What advice would you give to current players now to deal with the actual physical pain of the NFL? Because obviously there's all kinds of of drug, alcohol, there's all kinds of things out there. What advice would you give to a player today? Just try to just keep them on a straight narrow and say, this is an effective way of pain management. Yeah. Well, because of the amount of money that they make, they can do this. But we couldn't do it. What I'm about to say, we couldn't do. Now, I did it, but I found people that would do it for free. Look, they need to get a massage daily to keep the blood flow to all the tissue in their body so that it can heal. And they need to eat a well-balanced diet. Now, I know that we all grew up eating the way we eat. We learned how to eat from grandma, grandpa, mom, dad. But you can't eat like that and play a 16, now it's a 17 game season. And that's before the playoffs start. Just as an example, real quick, I played 21 games my rookie year. We played five preseason games, 16 regular season games, and then we played a playoff game. So 22 games. That's That's two seasons of college football in one season before you even get to the playoffs. So you have to take care of your body. And if you're not eating a well-balanced diet to bring in those vitamins and minerals so that your body can heal itself, then you're in trouble. Um, The drugs, you have to resist it because it just masks the pain. It does not heal you. It just masks the pain. And you don't want to get hooked on painkillers because they'll damage your internal organs. They'll damage your lungs. They'll damage your liver. They'll damage your spleen. Okay, they'll damage your kidneys. And next thing you know, you get to be 35, 40 years old and they talking about kidney replacement, put you on dialysis. So you you gotta stay away from those drugs. The human body can repair itself Mm -hmm. if you will feed it what it needs and, and get some rest. You know, I know that, hey, when the weekend come, you know, we like to run them streets, get to that club, this, that, and the other. Well, however long your career is, you got to put that on hold. So if it's a 10-year career, for 10 years, you got to resist going out to the clubs, hanging in the streets, chasing and drinking, because it's only going to shorten your career, or you're going to end up playing hurt because your body won't heal. And uh, I think I said this before, 100% of the people that play in the National Football League get hurt, even the kickers. Because every now and then, there's a breakaway run, and they got to try to tackle somebody, and they ain't used to tackling nobody, and they get jacked. Even if they make the tackle, they get jacked because they ain't been hitting. So you got to be able to recover from these injuries, and you got to do it with rest. You got to do it with nutrition and go to these chiropractors to get adjusted to keep your nervous system flowing to all parts of the body and go get a massage to keep that tissue um, full of blood so that that blood can bring the nutrients that you need to heal your body and guys can do that now because they you know like I said earlier minimum wage is 660,000 a year so you can afford the chiropractor you can afford the um, massage person, but you got to take care of your body. 
660000 a year. I think I still have four years of college eligibility left. I might have to see what I got <laughs> right now. I'm going to see what I got. <clears throat> yeah, um, minimum wage was $18,500 in 1979. A season, not a game. A season. It's unreal. So that actually, that brings up an, another question that, that I have then. You know, I mean, you touched on this too. Bad company corrupts good character. We got to be careful who we surround ourselves with and what what those people are are telling us. If the spirit lives on the inside of us, we got to be careful what we're exposing the the Holy Spirit to. You know, so you got you got young. I would I would call them kids coming out potentially making at least six hundred sixty thousand dollars a year. What kind of yep. financial advice would you give to the to these young athletes coming in today? Save more money than you spend. There you go. But they don't listen. Because <laughs> they ain't going to go broke like we did. And we didn't make no money. But they ain't going to go broke. And that's not, not true. Because three or four years after your NFL career, guys are filing bankruptcy because they're broke. Wow. And they won't listen to us older guys. They know better than us. They think that we're all broke because we spent our money on foolish things and shoot, we didn't have enough money to spend. What I'm gonna spend $25,000 on foolishly because that was my first year contract, you know? But that's a big difference between 660,000. I can give you an example. As the president of the NFL Players Association Denver chapter, I would have to go every year to training camp to speak to the team, not just the rookies, but the team after the final roster was made. And back then, a couple of years back, minimum wage was 580,000 a year. And so they were having their meeting and uh, I came in to talk to them about all the benefits that they would have, how they should be filing for a workman's comp while they're playing, for their injuries because there's only a statute of limitation if you don't file you'll never get paid for that injury you know don't get caught up that this was a, a, a very physical game and you're gonna get hurt and I knew what I was getting into before I got into it hey you're gonna be carrying that shoulder injury knee injury back injury hip injury ankle injury brain injury into the rest of your life if you don't collect your workman's comp on it. They got a workman's comp insurance policy on you and you need to file. Don't be afraid that the team is gonna cut you because you filed, you need to file. Well, anyway, they were trying to decide at that time because the collective bargaining agreement was two years away. So they was trying to get ready for it early. And they wanted to know, they asked this question, should we raise minimum wage from 580,000 to 700 or 750 a year? That means the retired guys are gonna get less money in their retirement plan. And some of the top paid guys in the league right now are gonna to have to take a little bit less money in order to raise that minimum wage to 700 or to 750. Well, there was a free agent in the room. I knew him since he was a kid here in Denver. I ain't gonna say his name, but he was making $550,000 a year and still living in his parents' basement. And he said, yeah, we need to raise it to 700,000 because I'm struggling on 580. See, just the look on your face. See, you know how I felt when minimum wage was $18,500. He said he was struggling on 580 and he was still living at home in the same house he grew up in when he was going to high school. And I doubt if he spent $580,000 to pick up his mama and daddy's basement. I don't know if it's a good idea that the host of the show is biting his tongue, but I think I'm just gonna sit here and be quiet. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm, I have a guess at who that might be, and I'm just, I'm just gonna sit here and be quiet. So I'm not gonna say anything. I've, I've already insulted the Dallas Cowboys. I'm not gonna insult the Broncos too. I'm done. Right. <laughs> I'm done. I've said enough. And recently, we had a player that did a podcast, 
and he was trying to explain how $90 million over his eight year career wasn't a lot of money and how easy it was to spend $90 million. Not 90,000, 90 million. And he was justifying it. And I only got 30 million when I first signed. So this isn't like something we're going to have to edit. We have awkward silence right now because my heart is beating out of my chest. <laughs> I, I, Vance said something, something similar. And if I had $90 million right now, I'd be sitting next to you in Colorado. <laughs> At my, <laughs> I'd be there right now. <laughs> oh boy. It's. You know, it, it comes down to, again, this is why you need to have the right people in your life to have the right, you know, just to be yes. able to tell you, like, look, you know, you have this and you may, I mean, what NFL running back, sometimes they, I mean, you're talking average five to six years, right? I mean, yeah. Frank Gore's probably, Frank Gore's probably completely skewed that average right now. Yeah. But, well, the average life of any player is 3.24 years. Wow. And that's the guys that play 16, 70. Brady done knocked it out the box. And it's still 3.24 years. The turnover is that much. And that's why they need people in their lives to say, all right, hey, this is now. Let's, I always tell people, younger me is taking care of older me in case I don't have the energy or the health to do the things I'm doing right now. So that's why I save and invest now. So Older me, can I, I try to always tell people, like, do something today that your future self is going to thank you for. So what can I do today that future me is going to thank me for? And that saving and investment is one of those things that I said, okay, I need to make sure that my younger self, while I'm physically and mentally able to do it, and, you know, you pray to God, that's always the case. It takes care of a future me. So. Yeah. So I'm just going to, I'm going to list these off because I, I don't want to mess this up. So Denver Broncos alumni president from 2001 to 2002. Yes. NFL PA Denver chapter 2014 to 2020. Yes. And then you've got the NFL alumni association, Rocky mountain chapter yes. 2021 of the present. Yes. So what made you decide to get involved in that capacity and stay involved and if you want to describe what your role is right now at the at the rocky mountain chapter and just maybe describe your role a little bit at these organizations what what motivated you to to get involved and do these as a football fan and you don't know what's going on behind the scenes you you only get the final product on television on thursday night Sunday night, Monday night, and then when the playoffs, they might play a Saturday game every now and then. And that's all you know as a fan. And so you think you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. But as a player, it's totally different. So having been a player, actually having been a fan, and then a player, and then back to being a retired player and kind of semi-fan, because it's hard to be a fan after you play because you understand all the politics on the other side of it. Well, I just saw so many guys that were not prepared for the game to be over. People don't know this. There is no medical plan, dental plan, insurance plan for retired players. They do have an insurance policy that they keep on you until age 55. But after age 55, that policy drops. So if you should pass away, if you didn't pick up that policy yourself, your surviving family would have to bury you. Uh, some guys haven't been to the doctor since their last physical with the team that they played because they don't have enough money to be able to afford insurance for instance all my years of teaching after i was done i paid a minimum of eight hundred dollars a month for the family plan for insurance well when you played in a league and you only made a few thousand dollars a year you don't have you can't afford 
eight hundred dollars a month just on health insurance. So guys take chances. They just hope that they're healthy. They believe I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And you don't know whether you have high blood pressure unless you go get it checked. Mm-hmm. You don't know unless you get a physical every year that you may have some underlying conditions. So I saw a lot of guys dying at young ages. I saw them definitely filing for bankruptcy. And then I watched them limping around for the rest of their life because at one point we didn't have free joint replacement. And now we do. So I just watched so many guys hurting and then we got a lot of grassroots organizations out here that provide benefits. And I know what those benefits are. So I try to have meetings to let guys know this is what's available for you. Even if you signed a contract with the league, play one game, or if you are a vested player, which is three years now, it was five years when I started, then it went to four, now it's down to three. Uh, that you could qualify for pension and a lot of guys took their pensions early because you can take the nfl pension at 45 years old 55 years old or 65 Hmm. the best thing to do is wait until 65 for it to max out we we had a lot of guys that were afraid well i'm not going to live that long because at one point when i retired the average life expectancy of an nfl player was age 53 So they're like, well, I ain't going to make it to 55 or 65, so I need to take it now. Well, they took it before it matured. They took 25% of it when they retired. So now you got guys literally getting $100 a month, $128 a month retirement. Wow. Because they took it early. Now, they took it early not because, just because, well, I'm broke and I need the money. No, they needed that money to buy their pharmaceutical medicines to just deal with everyday life. So they took it early. And a lot of guys did not graduate from college. And a lot of guys did not go back to school after they were done because they couldn't afford it. Now, I graduated before I ever got into the NFL. But Ohio State had a program where if you were a scholarship athlete, and you left school to go play pro ball, no matter how long you were out, you could take classes anywhere in the country, transfer them back to Ohio State to get your degree. Hmm. And one of the guys that I know personally, Clark Kellogg, that's how he graduated. Even though he got out early to play in the NBA, once he was done, he took his classes and sent them back to Ohio State. And I actually was there the day he found out that he graduated. I was with him and Archie Griffin. And um, a lot of guys are doing that now, but a lot of guys aren't motivated to go back to school. And a lot of those guys only went to school to try to get drafted to play some pro sport. They were not interested in getting an an education that would take care of them for the rest of their lives. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. So my job as the president is to make sure that everyone in my region is aware of the benefits that are available to them through these grassroots organizations. I mean, there's a number of them. It'd be nice if the league would just step up to the plate and say, hey, we're gonna take care of our former players, just like the government needs to step up to the plate. We're gonna take care of our military, retired military that went and got got blown up, but it's kind of the same thing, man. Once you're done, they done with you. So I just felt a need, a Christian need too. Hey, I can help take care of these guys and make life after football a lot better than it is. And of course, you get to share the gospel with them because they want to know why you do what you do too. And I tell them, it's because I'm a Christian, man, and I love you and I care about you and you are my teammate and I'm not going to let you fall through the crack. So you all, you answered one of the questions that I ask every guest is why do you do what you do? So I'm going to, I'm going to pivot from, from there. And would you say that being a part of these organizations 
that that is just one of the ways that you're that one of the ways you're sharing your faith using your testimony like do you do you look at that as a ministry being a part of those those organizations yeah i look at it that way because i know that if god didn't place me in that position to be an nfl player mm -hmm. i wouldn't have that platform to even operate from so this is a very closed door system you can't just walk up in there and and have relationships with players especially now because they make way too much money and they don't know who the alligators are that's just trying to get money out of them. but being a president of an organization being a member of those organizations there's a level of trust what guys will seek you out and they will listen to what you have to say and then if they see that you have been successful outside of football then they have a, a a better spirit to listening to you because a lot of guys have told me hey man i know i made way more money than you and i can't believe that you have the houses that you have the cars that you have the clothes that you wear the, the things that you do and i tell them hey man jesus is good and he took care of me i saved all my bonus money i saved all my playoff money incentives severance pay i mean i didn't even buy a house until i was done because there were no guaranteed contracts then and you get cut you get paid for the last game that you played unless you made it past eight games if you made it past eight games then they have to pay you the rest of the season if they cut you between one and eight they pay you for that last game and you on your own and i didn't want to get cut because i missed the pass missed an assignment missed the tackle dropped the ball and you out on the street. How you gonna pay your house note? How you gonna pay your car note? I bought used cars and paid cash for them. Okay, because if I got cut, they wasn't coming and taking nothing back. And I had a one bedroom efficiency apartment. Ain't that a shame? And I was an NFL player. No, didn't they? I remember um I forgot who was saying, I forgot what I don't I don't know if it was NFL films. I can't remember what show I was watching. But they said Terrell Owens, for example, had this has the same car now that he had when he was in high school. Mm -hmm. Same yep, car, you know. So I mean, I think I think there's a lot of wisdom in okay, do I really need this watch or this 32 bedroom mansion? I mean, you know, I do um I do major gift fundraising for a living. So I meet with alumni of the university that I work at and I ask them to give back a million dollars to five million dollars to university whether it be for new buildings, for scholarships, all kinds of things. So I meet with, I meet with some pretty wealthy people on a, on a consistent basis. And some of them say very similar things to what, what you said. He's like, how much do we really need this mansion? And then to have these three houses. And then there's others who have the mansions and then have the houses all over and have a garage full of cars, you know? So, yeah. um, no, I, I hear you. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, um, I think if you can't if you can't manage eighteen thousand dollars, you're not going to be able to manage six hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Right. Or five hundred and three million. Right. I was I was I was blocking that out of my head. I did math or I blocked that out of my head. <laughs> Deshaun Watson, two hundred and thirty million guaranteed. I'm not even I'm I'm not even gonna touch that because I'm trying not to get canceled in whatever episode week this is. I'm just gonna let the lawyers and the legal people deal with that. I'm not even mentioning I'm letting that go. <laughs> I'm not messing with that. Uh, God has been good. Right. And I don't mean that trivially, because I'm telling you, this is my 43rd year as of April. My 43rd year being a Christian. Mm. a follower of christ not i believe in god anybody can say they believe in god that's real how you live in your life will demonstrate whether you are serving god or believing in god so now i had a chance to share that with vance johnson you know 37 years after i was done with football he wanted to know wait why did you we were competing against each other at wide receiver. And here you were showing me how to run routes, how to read defenses. I said, man, because I'm a Christian and I love you. And if I was going to make the team, I got to make the team because I'm better than you. Not because you didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I said, 
your journey wasn't much different than mine other than he played college football, mm -hmm. but he was a running back and he had never played wide receiver. So let me show you how to do this, man. Right. That was the Christianity in me. And I, I believe I would have done it even if I wasn't a Christian because I'm just a nice guy. Right. And I want to make any football team because somebody else didn't know what to do because the system was so hard to learn. So you help and they're going to be your teammate too. You don't need them messing up when the games count. I'm grateful selfishly that you two help each other because I've had more podcast guests because of it. So I appreciate it. What you did in the seventies and eighties. Um, <laughs> Good looking out. <laughs> that actually, you know, and you you touched on something else. I talked to you about that a lot too. Loving God is one thing. What are you doing with his son? Because the only way of the father is through the son. You know, right. so, well, I, I hear a lot of people tell me that they they love God and they believe in God. I'm like, yeah. What are you doing with his son? So you 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 touched on something really good there. Yeah. So that actually, I got another football question for you based on what you just said about Vance. Um, how did you play the game then? Because I know a lot of these guys, they play super amped up and they play really, really angry. And it's like they get out there ready to rip somebody's head off. Um, right. And it's funny because I know I know a few professional fighters in, in the UFC and I've asked them the same question. I've said, you know, how do you hate the guy or, or, or woman staying across from you in the cage? Some of them say yes, and it's it's frightening. And I'm <laughs> and the other is like, no, this is my job. Right. I have no desire to get out there and hurt that person. You know, they have a husband or they have a wife, they have kids, you know, whatever the case may be. How did how did you go into every game? Yeah, I um reflected on these feelings after what came out a number of years ago when Dr. Amalu who I invited to come to Denver to talk to our former players, did the movie Concussion. Mm. And I used to ask the question, but nobody could answer me from 1979 until about, you know, 2018. Do you guys, why are you so angry? Why do you have to, what's wrong with you that you're blowing snot bubbles and breathing all crazy hard? <laughs> You know, that's, is this the way you have to play? Oh, man, you got to get hyped up for this game. Dude. Well, I think his brain injury myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if guys have been playing since Little League, junior high, high school, college, and now they're in the pros, well, I think they, they bang their brain around a little bit too much, and they got anger issues. Mm -hmm. I looked at it as an art. I can get downfield faster than you. You can't block me because you standing still and I'm running full speed. So I'm going to juke you, throw a move, go around. And yes, I'm going to hit the ball carrier hard to let him know, yeah, I'm coming. It's going to be like that on every play. But I never once hit a guy thinking I'm going to break his leg. I'm going to break his neck. I'm going to decapitate him. No, I was going to hit him hard, take him to the ground and let him know. All day, bro. All day. Bo right. two, be down here all day. Um, you know, playing receiver. Hey, I just wanted to just smooth past you, catch that rock, throw a move, gain as many yards as I could. And when you came to try to tackle me, I wasn't going to just let you tackle me. I was going to Jim Brown you. That's one thing I learned from Jim Brown to throw that forearm, to throw that hip <laughs> arm. Like Walter Payton, he punch you. He wait till you get right there and then pow, he lights you up. Because you can't take hits. You can't wince and just fold up and let them hit you because you'll be a rag doll. They'll break you. Um, when I played defensive back at Dallas, I just didn't want to get beat. I didn't want to get beat deep because everybody in the world saw that you got beat deep. And I didn't want to miss no tackles because you only get one shot. You miss that tackle, you give up big yards after that. So my job was to take you down. And because I was a wrestler all my life, I felt confident in being able to take you down because I used to have to take sweaty people down. And now I got material to grab. I'm not going to miss this tackle. So my job was to get you on the ground. My job was not to 
hurt you. So I just played the game like an artist. I tell people in, especially when, when we're, when we're sparring and we're kickboxing, I'm like, I don't want to get hit. Okay. Like I I'm going to avoid that at all costs. So, but I also let them know that once you hit me, I'm going to hit you back <laughs> in the friendliest, yeah. most loving way possible. <laughs> so, no, I think, I think this really, I think this speaks to just the, you know, I think that's a good, um, outlook that you had in the game of this is just this is work this is this is competition and i'm not out here to to hurt or or end anyone's career you know we're just out here to to compete and then make sure we go home the same way we walked in here so what is um what is life like for you for you now what are you doing these days well <clears throat> i'm retired i do a lot of traveling I um, have a vacation home where I can go and get away. Uh, I just recently sold the one in the mountains and I'm buying one in Orlando, Florida right now. So I'm going from the snow to the, to the heat. Um, I'm jealous. Managing, you know, being the president of this organization and helping out older players. And having been a teacher for 30 years, you know, I got kids now that are in their 50s, 51, 52, 53, and all the way back down to, to see, I, I retired 2019, 21. So I got them from 21 to 53. And they call on me because I was like their favorite teacher or their favorite coach. Mr. Manning was cool and he always was real with us. And uh, so they call on me. They know where I am, you know, they'll find you. And uh, so I have a chance to, like I'm coaching some of their kids now. <laughs> Cause I'll, I coach track, get kids ready for their AAU meets. And uh, so, you know, I'm coaching some of my former players, grandkids, you know? And so it's just rewarding to have been in one spot for so long, 43 years. And, uh, and have had good relationships with people. So far, I haven't met any former player that doesn't like me or I don't like them, uh, whether we competed at the same position or not. You know, we are, we are tight, we're close. So just helping people. I think I'll help people all the way till I get up out of here and, you know, doing Bible studies. There you go. You know. And uh, I do my own personal Bible study with Dr. Tony Evans every day. And just recently, his son, Anthony, who played for the Cowboys for a minute, he just took over that. He's doing a, a, a little series on there right now. So it's kind of weird not hearing Tony's voice, but hearing Anthony's voice. And Anthony, if he's listening, or if I get to talk to him, man, he sounds just like his mom, Lois. Oh, wow. He sound, you can hear her voice in his voice. I, um, I know, I know we're getting, we're getting close on, on time here, but I do want to, I do want to touch on that. So where do you, cause I, whenever I talk to someone or I get ready to meet someone, I want to, I want to find a way to talk about my faith or share my faith with them or share the gospel message with them, share Jesus with them in some capacity. So I know that you're, you're, you know, you were in the school system. So how have you been able to find ways to, to do that, to just really kind of talk to people about Christ? Yeah, while I was teaching, you know, there was this unwritten rule that you don't mix church and state. And there's nowhere written in the Constitution, school policy, district policy, or state law that you don't mix church and state. But that's the myth. And you try not to violate because you don't want to be in trouble with your principal or the superintendent of the district. But there's a big, huge loophole. And I don't know if they are aware of the loophole. And they'll tell you, as long as a student is willing to talk to you about religion, you can talk about it. It's just that you can't bring it up and you can't force your belief system on them 
So I literally try to love kids to Christ, meaning this. When they see how I handle myself, who I am as a person in the classroom, in the hallways, on the practice field, game day, and they ask me, Mr. Manning, why are you the way you are? Why are you so nice? And I tell them, I'm a Christian. Hmm. And they go, what? Yeah, I'm a Christian. That's why I'm so nice. Now, I could be nice in and of myself, but at some point, without Christ in my life, I'm going to go bad. Growing up in Cleveland, too, yeah, I'm going to go bad. I'm, I'm going to go ghetto on you. You don't want me to ghetto on you. You want me to be a Christian. Um, but the other ones is kids misuse the word of God in vain mm -hmm. by something, whatever it is, could be something minor or major, something go wrong. Oh, my God. And I go, Rami, do you know? Him? Huh? <laughs> you just, oh, my God. So I figured you had a relationship with them and you're trying to call on them right now to help you out in this situation. And that's how they open that door. Jesus, criminy. Oh, so you know Jesus. Dang, I'm a Christian too. And then we start talking. So I just, they crack that door. I put my foot in it. There you go. And if they go running talking about, you can't talk to me about religion. I say, hey, you was the one that brought up Jesus. You was the one that brought up God. You was the one that asked me why I am the way I am. So I just told you. So we can go down to the principal. We can talk about it. They never did, though. <laughs> so God gave me a platform even there. And most of it was because of my behavior and how I carried myself. That actually sparked students to ask me, why are you the way you are? Mm -hmm. And even to this day, I just met up with some of my students that are 39 and 40 now. And they said, Mr. Manning, we always knew that you cared about us, not just as athletes or students. You genuinely cared about us. And that's why we are still close to you to this day. And that's why we invite you to our home, want you to meet our kids. And we tell our kids about you all the time. And this is my coach. And this is the effect that he had on me. And these are white kids, too. Okay, so it ain't just the black kids, you know. And I have quite a few black kids whose parents is like, hey, if it wasn't for you, they would have never walked the straight and narrow. And I told them the same thing you told them. But they ain't listen to me. And they somehow listen to you. I said, well, sometimes they got to come from somebody else. And because you did say it to them, the seed was already planted for that thing to grow. Right. And they heard someone else who in their mind had been successful, an NFL player, a division one player, a college graduate. And so you planted the seed and God watered that seed. And now we got different growth going on. I got a few questions left, but selfishly, this question is only for me. <laughs> Being a Denver Broncos fan, along with Cleveland Browns fan in Ohio is obviously dangerous. Okay. I'm lucky to be alive right now, but John Elway is one of my favorite athletes. So every Denver Broncos player I have ever talked to who played with John Elway has a broken finger John Elway story. <laughs> Every last one of them, every, every, they'll hold up their hands and their hands will look like it went through a meat grinder or a garbage disposal because this man apparently throws a football, the equivalent of a bullet being shot out of a gun. Like, it's crazy how hard people say he throws a football. Yeah. You got to have, I might guess that you got to have one. You have <laughs> well, the first ball he ever threw to me was a 12-yard out. We called it a square out. You break at 10, roll it to 12, and run to the sideline. It looked like he shot an arrow at me. <laughs> you better catch it, because if it hits you, you could die. <laughs> I reached up to catch this out. And I didn't have no gloves on, and we didn't have stick them. They had outlaw stick them by then. Thanks to Lester Hayes putting it all over him like pig pen. 
and the ball hit between my index, my middle finger and my ring finger. And it just split the skin in my hand and blood just fizzed in the air. I caught the ball. There you go. <laughs> but, but I had to get stitches. And from that point on, I wore golf gloves, a half a size small, pulled them on as tight as I could, like skin, and then taped the wrist part real tight so that the leather wouldn't move. And I started wearing golf gloves. We didn't have the little sticky tacky gloves that they wear now, but I was wearing a golf glove that was a half a size smaller than my hand to get that that uh, leather as tight as I could, like skin, to take some of that heat off of it. So to anyone listening, I'm not crazy. Well, I am, but that's the point. The fact that every every player that I know that's ever played with him has a story about how he's broken their hands throwing a football at him. This is it's unreal. <laughs> it's unreal. The other thing is, you know, do you have strings on your chest protector for your shoulder pads? You could put brand new strings. And if that ball hit, them strings busted. We ain't talking about no dry rotted, sweaty strings that have been in there for ages. No, we're talking about brand new shoelaces that you tie the breastplate. And if that ball hit your breastplate, them strings was busted. <laughs> so I'm guessing. My, the answer to my well, my question next is what is your favorite memory as a player? And I'm betting it's not catching that pass from John Elway. <laughs> <sighs> well, probably one of my favorite plays, and I can't remember if I sent it to you or not, but you know, you're a rookie and you ain't even supposed to be in the league and you're with the Dallas Cowboys. You make it through to the fifth preseason game because we played the Hall of Fame game that year. You make it through to the fifth preseason game. And future Hall of Famer coach Tom Landry comes up to you and says, wait. I don't know how you're doing this. You're averaging 17.2 yards of punt return, 35 yards of kickoff return, and you haven't even broke one yet. He said, I need you to do something on this punt to overly convince me that I should keep you on this team. And I just looked at him and said, okay, coach, I'm going to give 100% like I've been. Let's see what happens. And before I ran out on the field, Tony Dorsett, who had a broken toe, he had that wooden shoe on his foot so he wouldn't bend his toe. He reached and he grabbed me by the arm and he said, man, show me something. All that daggone speed. Show me something. And I went out there and I ran a 62-yard punt return. And the first guy was as close as, to me as I am to the screen on this computer. And I made him miss. And then I went down the Pittsburgh sideline, juked the linebacker, number 54, and went all the way 50 yards across field and up the sideline past our bench and got knocked out of bounds <coughs> on the six yard line. When I got up and walked back to the bench, Coach Landry just nodded his head. And I knew I had made the team. But then the next week was opening day against the St. Louis Cardinals. OJ Anderson was a rookie. He gained 193 yards and a touchdown, and the touchdown that he scored put them up 21 to 19 with about two minutes left in the game. And I go to Mike Dicka, your favorite guy. <laughs> Coach Dicka, if they kick the ball to me, and I said if because we had a two deep tandem at that time, me and Ron Springs, if they kick the ball to me, can I go left? Now, that might seem like a weird question, but you have to run the ball where they design it to go. If they call middle return, you got to go middle. Right return, you got to go right. Well, he hadn't put a left return in yet. And I wanted to go left because all day long, the safety on my left, their right, was always trying to sneak around the backside to make a play. He wasn't staying in his lane. So Dicka basically cussed me out. 
that we didn't have a, a left return in yet. And in so many choice words, it better work. So they kicked me the ball. I started middle, took one hard jab step to the right. And that guy came around and I broke left. And I got around him and went down our sideline for 40 plus yards, 47 yards, I believe, got knocked out on the sideline and Landry sent the field goal team on the field and kicked the field goal. And we won that game 22 to 21. I made special teams player of the week. I made the front of the Dallas Cowboy weekly. And Landry came to my locker in the locker room and said, how are you doing this? And I gave him a classic answer. Just running scared, coach. Just running scared. Don't want to get hit. <laughs> That's a good response. <laughs> That brings me to my final question, which is the final segment of this show. This is our let them know segment. So this is the part of the show. The floor is yours. Whatever you like to share with the audience, anything you'd like to, to say, whether it be a Bible verse, word of encouragement. Thank you so much for being here today. But this this is your moment. So, <clears throat> sir, please let them know. All right. Well, my favorite Bible verse is Matthew 6.33. Okay. God is always first. Okay. God is first. And he will give you. He will give you. All these other things. Okay. But you got to keep them first. It doesn't matter what your desire is. If it's in God's will, you're going to get it. So you should always be asking for what you believe God wants you to have. With football, after I became a Christian, hadn't had my first practice yet, my whole goal was to please God. And my whole belief was, if he wants me to be a Dallas Cowboys, Tom Landry can't stop it. Gil Brandt can't stop it. The owner can't stop it. The president of the team can't stop it. It's going to happen, but I have to do my part. And I just lifted them weights, and I did all that running and all that studying so that when I went to training camp in Thousand Oaks, California, I could do my best. And it all worked out. And I made the team. And I remember Robert Newhouse saying to me during training camp, come over here, young man, sit down here and have lunch with me. And I sat down at a table with a veteran player and had lunch with him. And he said, man, you act like you're going to make this team. And I said, well, I believe that I can. He said, no, 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 no. The way you move, carry yourself, everything is like, you're going to make this team. And I looked at Robert and I said, Robert, if God wants me to make this team, can't nobody stop it. And my job is to come out here every single day, every practice and give 100%. And that's what I'm going to do. And based on what I see competition wise, I can make this team. I'm faster than everybody. I can backpedal better than everybody else. I can stop and start quickness, catch the ball. I said, man, I'm catching punts with two hands over my head, behind my back, one hand, left hand, right hand. I said, these guys are getting hit in the face mask with the ball, dropping the ball behind them, misjudging it. And I said, I just, I think I can do this. And I made the team. And me and Robert became friends until he passed away two years ago. We were close. Big old, big thigh, Robert Newhouse, 44. <laughs> His thighs were bigger than Earl Campbell's. That probably means bigger than my entire body. So that doesn't make me feel hey. inadequate at all. <laughs> Each thigh was like tackling somebody's waistline. I'm gonna let I'm gonna leave that up to you. That's not the sport I play. I'm gonna leave that up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
thank you so much, Wade, for for coming on today. You know what? I'm gonna um I'm gonna pray us out really quick because this has been a huge blessing for for myself, the audience. Thank you so much for just taking the time to do this today. I just want to take time to pray for you and your your ministry right now. So, Father, I just want to um I just want to lift up and thank you for everything that you've uh, you've done today. I just I pray that everyone who who listened received uh, something out of out of this podcast today, Lord. Father, I just want to thank you for everything you're doing in Wade and and through him. Lord, I pray you just continue to to guide his hands, guide his feet, guide his speech, Father. Continue just to bless everything that that he is doing, Lord. I thank you that he's more than a conqueror. That he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. That he who was in Wade is greater than he who was in the world. So I just thank you for just um, the fact that we can just talk about you freely. I thank you that we just had a chance today just to, to come together as, as just brothers and, and sisters in Christ to just glorify your name and just talk about some of the things you're doing in our lives, Father. I just pray you're on your traveling mercies over him as he gets ready to depart, Lord. I, I just want again, just thank you for just everything you're doing, not just in us, but in all the listeners, Lord. We just give you all the credit, all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. No problem, man. Thank you so much for this today. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I'll have to come out there to Colorado and race you one day just to see if you still got it. So I don't. I don't run no more. <laughs> I'll just but, I'll, I'll walk briskly. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, but uh, I do seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness so that all these things shall be added unto me. God is good. Amen. Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate your time today. All right. Take Have care. Thank, thank you, Vance Johnson, for hooking us up. Thank you, Vance. I appreciate it. Really? Two Clevelanders, too? Man, I can't believe it. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was already written. It was already written. <laughs> God, God knew what he was doing. <laughs> yeah.